yeah, and then commercial networks. Let's come to our last speaker, Erika Squassina, graduated in archival and library science in 2011. And four years later, she obtained a PhD in book history in this same university with a thesis about the privilege system in Venice. And I was her tutor. Since 2013, she has worked as teaching assistant in the courses of book history and library science at the same University of Udine. Since March 2016, she is a postdoc researcher at the University of Cagliari, where she is working at the project of a complete census of 16th century editions in Sardinian libraries. For the IMO Book Trade Project, she is responsible of the sub-project on the book privilege system in Venice up to 1603 through the study of the archival records uh, in the Venice State Archives, and she has joined the groups tomorrow too. To start. Thank, you. Thank you. Venice was the first government in Europe to introduce the use of privileges in the book trade. The earliest privilege was granted on the 18th September 1469 to the German printer Johannes de Spira in recognition for having introduced a new method of book production into the city. Printing became in little time one of the most important economic activities of Venice and in this context privileges emerged as a way of regulating competition in the publishing sector and safeguarding the interest of the city's printers. The protection envisaged in the privilege was based on the principle of use prebendi, in the sense that no one but the holder of the privilege had the right to exercise the activity specified in the privilege. In particular, it was forbidden to print the work in question, which was thus placed under protection, or import and sell an edition of the same work printed abroad. Whoever contravened the privilege was liable to fines and other administrative sanction as the confiscation of works illegally printed. Furthermore, the guilty party had to pay compensation to the holder of the privilege for the damage caused by paying in agreed sum for each copy or an overall amount regardless of how many counterfeit copies had been discovered. The proceeds were divided between two or more recipients. There was really only one recipient. One could be the individual who had denounced the offender Another one could be the official of the state who have made the confiscation of copies. One or more could be part of the Venetian charitable system, like hospitals. Sometimes penalties were harsher and including the destruction of the counterfeit copies or the exile or imprisonment of the transgressors. The procedure for obtaining a privilege required a specific process. It was started by a petition by the supplicant, the content of which was subsequently incorporated into the concession itself. The petitioners fell into two groups, bookmen and authors, may could be printers, publishers, merchants, inventors, university teachers, men of letters, musicians, architects, artists, lawyers, diplomats, and so on. In the hilly years, privileges were mainly granted by the Collegio. Hence, most of the survival grants are to be found in the register label Notatorio Collegio. From 1517, only the Senate called grand book privileges, and therefore privileges appear as a rule in the acts of the Senato Terra, including the series of petitions, filze, which are seldom preserved. All these documents are now preserved in the Venetian State Archive. Every privilege had a specific duration. The time period during which a privilege remained invalid corresponding to the length of the time regarded as necessary for, for the production of an edition and the subsequent sale of the copies and code lasts from six months to 25 years, 
also the, the average duration was for 10 years. In fact, 85% of the privileges granted until 1545 was fixed at 10 years. In addition to temporal duration, privileges were geographically limited to Venice and the territories under its dominion. Heaven Tung it was the city of Venice itself, which was of greatest concern to the authorities. Normally, privileges were granted to printers working in the city of Venice and only really to those working on the mainland, since the principal aim of the legislation was to protect the city's printing industry. And it was even rare for a privilege to be granted for a work which was going to be printed outside Venetian territory. This use of privileges to protect the city's publisher was peculiar to Venice and is not found in the other Italian state, which granted privileges regardless of the place where the edition was going to be printed. Analyzing the register of college, senate, and chief of the Council of Ten, I have identified about one, uh, 406 privileges granted until 1545. At the beginning, the development of the privilege system has been slow. In fact, the Republic granted the second privilege to the Venetian humanist and historian Marco Antonio Sabellico only in 1486. 17 years later, the first privilege obtained by Johannes de Spira. Five years later, the third privilege was granted to the Venetian patrician Andrea Badoer for his Portland. And it is only from 1492 that the number of privileges began to grow. From 1492 to 1498, there is a steady increase followed by a decline until 1511, when only one privilege was granted. In these years, there is a decrease in the book production due to the wars of the League of Cambrai, the unsettled state of the Republic, and the disturbance of trade in general. The political instability had negative effects on productive activities by reducing competition. Therefore, in this situation, I think that the use of the privilege was less necessary. This period of relative depression is followed by the first epoch of legislation, started with the 1517 decree, followed by a series of laws which aim to defend the rule of the Venetian privilege system. Over these years, about 1,500 works were protected by privileges, out of a total number of 13,000 editions produced by the city's printing houses. An interesting aspect emerged if we give our attention to the various types of privilege, which can be grouped in three categories. The most frequent type was commercial privileges, requested in order to protect a work or collection of works and for the most part granted to publishers. Then there were the technical privileges protecting the new invention and technologies used in the printing industry. For example, the privilege granting to Aldo Manuzio for his Greek typeface. As a matter of course, the privilege protecting not only the new techniques applied in the printing houses, but also the books which were the result of the application of the new technique. Finally, we can find literary privileges granted to authors in order to protect their economic interest when they came to select a publisher for the publication of their work. Out of the total number of book trade privileges issued by the Venetian authorities in the period up to 1545, 44% were literary, while the remaining 56% were divided between commercial and technical privileges. Thus, although it is true that the majority of privileges were issued to publisher, as we can see, there is only a quite narrow difference between the number of commercial and the number of literary privileges. 
Moreover, the authors who, request, who requested a privilege were more than printers, 172 authors, 114 printers. Usually, each author demanded only one privilege, in contrast to printers, for whom grants per capita were very frequent. For example, the most active in obtaining privileges, Michele Tramezzino, had requested 16 privileges for 43 works. Many printers made a standard use of privileges in their normal activity and regarded them as an indispensable safeguard for their financial investment, whereas for author it was less customary. The fact that the number of literary privileges is very close to the number of commercial privileges is a sign that contemporary authors saw privileges as a useful instrument to protect their own economic interests and, indirectly, their own reputations. From an author's point of view, the protection of a literary work consists in the need to ensure that he received the potential profits from the publication and the desire to preserve his text in its integrity. Publishers customarily printed a work without, without an author's permission and paid little heed to its presentation, sometimes altering content and styles of expression. If we analyze the privileges granted to authors over the period, we can distinguish a first phase where the con concessions are few, and the second phase, starting in the 20s of the 60th century, where the number grows in a remarkable way. The law introduced in 1517 had imposed the granting of the privilege only to new works, never published before, and this is reflected by a significant increase in the number of literary privileges in the following years. However, the peak of concession came in 1545, when the Council of Ten issued a law prohibiting anyone to print or sell books without having first obtaining the consent of the author of the work. Although the Republic's primary objective was to impose controls on publishing, this law gave legal definition for the first time to the concept of authorship, protecting authors' interests over against those of publishers. The protection provided by the Republic and confidence in the efficacy of the provision encourage authors to entrust their works to publishers. This increase in the number of literary privileges reflects a growing awareness of the social and political value of the written word and of the possible juridical dimension of the role of writers. In conclusion, it can be said that the system of privileges played a crucial role not only in the protection of commercial interest, but also in the growth of the legal recognition of authors and the legal underpinning of the perceived utility of written production. The protection offered by the Republic of Venice promoting the production of new works in the same way, the production of new works led to an increase in the book sales and, as a result, the economic and cultural growth of the Republic. Thank you.